Today we are wrapping up our Imagine Heaven series, and I have with me a special guest, Dr. Tracy Goza. Help me welcome Dr. Tracy. Uh, thanks for having me. <laughs> And uh, I, wanted, I wanted to start out interviewing uh, Tracy because I, we actually met right after I finished writing Imagine Heaven. She had actually just finished writing a book called I Heart Heaven, a psychotherapist, biblical validation for near-death experiences. And we met each other and it was, it was amazing because um, we're both Christians and we had both studied this and we're talking about how does this tie in with the scriptures. And uh, so th this is an awesome, awesome book. And what's really cool is Tracy did her PhD under one of the leading researchers in near-death experiences. Yes. And so talk about in your research, you know, I know one of the things as a, as a psychotherapist that you're very interested in mm -hmm. Or the after effects. You know, sometimes people talk about how, well, aren't these just hallucinations or the effects of a dying brain? Um, but you talk about how the after effects in a person who's had a near-death experience actually validates it. Right, it's so Why different than in some sort of drug trip or hallucination. Those things are often um, fantastical and they make you feel really good, but they don't often carry with them some sort of moral point or some sort of moral change in the person that they might want to come back and live out as these happen to people, the near-death experiences do. So um, somebody who's had a near-death experience, it's completely different. They're a completely different soul after they come back. Um, so what, so are, what are some of the after effects that you've seen so in your So we've seen research? a whole range of things. Sometimes it's easy for people to come back and sort of assimilate what happened to them and, and live it out with love um, and generosity toward people. But sometimes um, people that may have sought a job that was more money-seeking or, or power or prestige, they become more philanthropic and they start giving and they want to just reach out to people. It can cause such a drastic change in the whole person. So spouses may not recognize their spouse afterward. I mean, physically they will, but they're soul has changed yeah. in their whole person. So, I mean, it's caused divorces before. It's really hard for people to really kind of put all the pieces together and move forward. Um, it's hard for others to kind of accept that too for them. Yeah, so, I mean, we, would, we would think, wow, wouldn't it be great if we could all have an experience like that? I know, like it that? seems but, like such a gift. But many come back and they're, they're depressed mm -hmm. because this seems less real, right. but also they realize the, the important things to live for. But it, like you said, I mean, we interviewed uh, Dr. Howard Storm, remember the college professor? who was an atheist before this experience, and he came back and ended up becoming a pastor. His wife was not happy about right, that. Right, that shift and, was not a, like an overnight shift. Yeah. It was painful for everyone involved. Yeah. So it's not uncommon. Well, and so, so you talk about in your, in your book about how the after effects actually mm -hmm. point to something valid uh, yes. because, because there is such a change in people. You also talk about how it's important, especially as churches, that when people have an experience, a near-death experience, um, how we treat them. Why is that? Right. Well, they're not crazy. And I, I think a lot of people think, oh, I experienced God in, in a way. So I'm going to go to church and I'm going to try to find God there. But sometimes when they get there, they may have found a congregation that's really more rigid and maybe more um, religious than um, open and accepting of, of hearing other spiritual kind of experiences that people are able to have. So I think it's really important that, you know, we kind of encourage people to come in. And, and I've, I've heard from people that it's hard for them to find a church home because it seems like there's a right thing to wear and a right thing to say in a right way to read the Bible, in a right way to, or they'll say, oh, you know, they didn't see God in their experience, or how do we know that was Jesus? Well, um, the experiencer knows what they saw, and they know how they felt about it. So if, if we're just careful about bringing them in and asking the right questions to draw them out, um, we can be a safe place for people seeking spiritual matters. Well, and you talk about how that, you know, many peop people who have these experiences, they are seeking God. They are. And churches can either be places that just kind of push them away or help mm -hmm. steer them to understand how the scriptures actually integrate with what right. they These what NDEs they saw. are so unique to each person and there's not one right way that God shows up to people. I think that's what I've seen over and over in my studies. Um, but we can all um, be very accepting of okay, tell me your story and, and tell me about that out-of-body experience. I mean, don't, I, I, I want us to not be afraid of such strange-sounding terms because they're really events that happen. And so Christians need to know about these terms and they need to know what they are to help draw people out and talk about it. And then we can say, hey, let's dig around in this Bible right here and how do you think that God was showing himself to you? Even if it was a distressing experience or hellish, what do you think God might be trying to say in a very non-judgmental way? Tell me about that. Let me walk through this with you. Let's see if we can't help you figure out what God was wanting you to know. 
So yeah. you can live your life again. This was not final death. So you get more of a chance to live in the way that he might like for you to. Yeah, so there's hope no matter There's so no matter much what. hope. Yeah. Well, and, and you talk about how the life review, which we're going to kind of focus on today, mm -hmm. is really one of those pivotal things that people experience. Talk about yes. what, what is that? They see their whole life. That, I mean, it's, I'm not sure exactly what the percentages of people that have the life review, but they will see a whole, um, the whole thing, maybe almost like they're watching a movie, their whole life play out, everything they've done or said to someone, and they feel the impact of how it, um, how it affected the other person. So they may um, just feel really terrible about something they did or said, but they see everything. There's nothing spared. And the, the light they often are standing with is just so all-encompassing, um, just the love and the, the light that's there, which we believe is Jesus, is just non-judgmental. And, and basically, they feel that judgment, but then they also feel that sense of, um, we can do better with this, and you get another chance. So mm -hmm. there's grace. That's what, it's what the Bible talks about. That they that actually grace. experience a sense of grace, even in... Right, that I get a chance to come back. Some people get to choose to come back and, and they get to try again and be more loving. And, but it's not a love that you just manifest yourself, like, like works-based love. I'm just gonna love, love, love. It's a love that flows from God and it's a love that flows through Jesus. Yeah. So, Well, I, I wanna encourage you to check this book out, I Heart Heaven. It's out on Amazon, Dr. Tracy Goza. And uh, it's, it's just one more strand of seeing yes. how the scriptures tie together mm -hmm. with these experiences that one in 25 people have had, That's right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's thank Dr. Goza for thank being with us thank today. Thank you so much. Thanks yeah. so much. And so today, as we wrap up uh, this series, I do want to talk about the life review and what is that? Uh, and you know, uh, a couple weeks ago, I interviewed Dr. Howard Storm, who's a college professor. He was an atheist when he had this near-death experience, and he said that he was rescued from this outer darkness when he cried out to Jesus, and that there from far off, he could see what he knew to be the city of God, and in the presence of Jesus and the angels, he has a life review. Then the first week I interviewed Dr. Mary Neal, a spine surgeon whose uh, kayak got submerged and, and jammed under a waterfall and she was dead for 30 minutes. And yet as she was passing, she experienced Jesus holding her and together they did a life review. Listen to how both of them talk about it. Howard, tell us about this life review that you had. There was a number of angels, I call them angels, who had been recording my entire life, all my life, and Jesus wanted them to play out in chronological order the scenes of my life. And the entire emphasis was on my interaction with other people, of course, initially starting out with my mother and father and my sisters and then, you know, school and friends. And, um, so you just, you saw it or you We saw it, experienced we felt it. it, we experienced it. It was really interesting because it was... Um, the whole emphasis was on people and not on things. Matter of fact, there were some instances where um, I had uh, won promotions, honors, awards, and they skipped them. And Jesus, I said to Jesus, uh, you're skipping the most important thing in my life. This is what I live for to get this award, Kentucky Artist of the Year. Big banquet in my honor and a big cash prize and everything. And uh, he said... That's not what we're here for you to see. That's not important. What I want you to see is how you treated the students. So what I learned in my life review was that um, the um, relationship with my father, I had participated in the breakdown of that relationship as much as he did. He was not a good father to me, and I resented it, and I was angry at him, so I did everything I could subconsciously and sometimes consciously to be as rebellious and as cold-hearted towards him as possible, which only aggravated him more and made him more of a hostile father. So the things that I had seen in my life that where I was the victim and everybody else was the bad guy, I came to find out. Um, it was a two-way street. We were both the plain of skin. As my life progressed from my adolescence into my adulthood, I saw myself turning completely away from God, church, all that, and becoming um, a person who decided that life was all about um, the biggest, baddest bear in the woods wins. And now I began to experience Jesus and the angels' literal pain. What do you mean? Emotional pain with watching scenes in my life. And like, here's the nicest, kindest, most loving being I've ever met, who I realize is my Lord, my Savior, even my Creator, 
holding me and supporting me, trying to um, give me more understanding of my life. And it was figuratively, not literally, like I was like stabbing him in the heart as we're watching this stuff. And the last thing I wanted to do was to hurt him. And I don't want to hurt him to this day. Uh, Jesus is a very feeling man. God is a very feeling creator. What were you seeing played out? I saw scenes where um, my sister was in bed crying and I got up in the middle of the night and went in and put my arms around her and hugged her. And Jesus and the angels were so filled with joy that I had been willing to do that, to try and um, you know, help her a little Comfort bit her. in her grief. But those were rare, the, uh, the scenes of my indifference. Just seeing, seeing people as objects in order to maneuver around through or you know, to shift to further my, my goals and my ambitions. We did go through a life review and it was nothing like I would have imagined. What, what my, was the life review like? My life was laid bare for all its good and bad. And one of the things we did was look at many, many, many events throughout my life that I would have otherwise called terrible or horrible or sad or bad or tragic. And instead of looking at an event in isolation or looking at how it impacted me and my little world, I had the most remarkable experience of seeing the ripple effects of the event when seen 25, 30, 35 times removed. You know, this life review in the presence of God is the most dramatic thing that happens for someone having a near-death experience. It clarifies what matters to God. And they realize it's about relationship. And they, they experience the reverberation person to person down through generations even. Now, the reality is we already knew this, right? Right? I mean, Jesus told us, he said, the greatest commandment is to love God first. And that means we, we put him first. We give ourselves back to God and we live to do his will more than our will. And the second, Jesus said, is like it, love your neighbor, love the people around you as much as you do yourself. And, and so we already know this, but do we really live that way? Well, this clarifies that, you know, all those things that we do to try to prove to the world we're worth something, they don't matter to God. That's not what matters to him. And, and yes, we have responsibilities. Yes, we have gifts to use and resources to steward. But what it makes really clear is that it's how and why we do all those things. Do we do the, all those things, all that we do? in order to love God and love other people, or are we doing it to try to prove ourselves and glorify ourselves? And the life review makes it really clear what God values. So what is this life review? Is this judgment? No, and that's what confuses many people. You know, the Bible talks about two judgments, and both of them come after the history of earth is done. So this is neither. But what the life review is, is it is a preview and a confirmation of what Jesus taught us. You know, Jesus said that to those who are faithful with the life God's given them, faithful to follow God, one day God is gonna say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. And today I want you to try to imagine that day. We need to try to imagine that day. Because, you know, if we can imagine a great retirement, we'll live for it, sacrifice, save for it, right? We'll do everything for that because we have a good picture of it. We'll imagine the day that's to come when God will show you the positive impact of your life, all these little ways that had these ripple effects. And you'll also see the negative ripple effects. And he wants to reward you. He wants to honor you. And that lasts forever. Jesus said, there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. And this is what the life review shows us. You know, Dr. Pem Van Lommel, um, a Dutch cardiologist who studied these experiences, says this, the life review is usually experienced in the presence of the light or a being of light. During a panoramic life review, people experience not just every action or word, but also every thought from their past life. 
and they experience the effects of their thoughts, words, and actions on other people. People can talk for hours, even days about their life review, even though the cardiac arrest only lasted a couple of minutes. You know, it's fascinating because regardless of cultural or religious upbringing, across the globe, these life reviews are pretty similar. In fact, in Imagine Heaven, I talk about uh, a study that Steve Miller did on non-Western, non-Christian near-death experiences, and he says this, in my non-Western sample, I saw no significant difference in life reviews compared to Western life reviews. In other words, People are unique and they experience it uniquely, but they're all shocked to see the same thing. They re-experience their life and even their thoughts and motives are revealed. And that's quite honestly shocking to people. But it's actually what the scriptures have told us all along. 1 Corinthians 4, 5, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. See, Jesus promised. It's not the things that we do to please others and show ourselves great to the world. It's these little unseen things that God wants to reward. Pay attention to those things because God sees every motive of the heart and he will reward it too. Matthew 6, Jesus said, don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others for you'll lose the reward from your father in heaven. In other words, if we just do it for others rather than for God, that's all we get. Give your gifts in private, he says, and your father who sees everything will reward you. Pray to your father in private, then your father who sees everything will reward you. Now just stop and think about this, you know? I mean, not everyone in the world can succeed in the world's eyes, right? And we all try, we all compete and run over each other, but not everybody is gonna be rich. Not everyone's gonna be powerful. Not everyone's gonna be famous. But everyone, everyone can succeed in the eyes of God. How? By being faithful to him with what he's given you uniquely. See, we all have a different life to live and a different race to run, but we can all be faithful that's why it says in Hebrews eleven six, without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. In other words, live for what really matters. Seek him, listen to him, obey him, love, serve, give to please him and you will not be sorry. He promises to reward it. You know, Dr. Jeffrey Long, uh, an oncologist who studied near-death experiences, noted this. He said, near-death experiencers generally note that they are the ones who judged themselves. In other words, in the presence of God, they don't feel judged or condemned by God. They feel unconditional love, but they note how they are their worst critics and their worst judges. Now, some researchers have, I think, wrongly interpreted this to say, see, there's no judgment. There, there, there's no such thing as judgment. We're, we're the only judges. But I think that's a miss in what they're experiencing and what scripture's actually said. Because Jesus said in Matthew 12, 35, but I tell you, everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words will you be acquitted, and by your words will you be condemned. See, this life review just shows that what Jesus said is really going to happen. And, and what the people in this life review experience is that God's love and God's acceptance of us is unconditional. It's not based on what we do or have done or, or even the shameful things that we've done. God's love and compassion is unconditional. And that's what scripture says. Salvation, right standing with God, it's a gift. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to jump through religious hoops. You don't have to prove yourself. You just have to receive it. So it says in Ephesians 2.8, God saved you, set you right with himself by his grace, when you believe, when you put your trust in him. You can't take credit for this. This is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward. There are rewards, but salvation's not one of them for the good things we have done so none of us can boast about it. Now, here's what I want you to understand. There are two judgments. They both happen after all of human history is done, okay? And, and the first one 
is called the great white throne. And it's simply, it's a judgment of whether we have accepted or rejected God's free gift of love and forgiveness and adoption and salvation, which he purchased for us through what Christ did. And, and in that day, our words will either, will either condemn us, I don't need you and I don't need your forgiveness, or acquit us, God, I need you, forgive me. That's all it takes, you see that? And the life review is reminding us of that. Now, the other judgment, actually, as we'll see, is a reward ceremony. But, you know, people dismiss this idea of judgment. It's not a popular idea in our culture. But interestingly, it's been in every culture just about for all time. And what's uncanny is that people who have near-death experiences confirm it. They confirm what the Scripture says. They even talk uh, uh, in, in these about books in heaven. You, they talk across the globe about what, what the scripture says. Look in Revelation 20, 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were open. Another book was open, which is called the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. What's uncanny is across the globe, near-death experiencers confirm Books in heaven. You know, Osis and Haroldson did a study of 500 Americans and 500 Indians to try to take out all cultural religious bias. And what they said about American NDEs is they said, see, it's not biblical at all because in this life review, people don't feel judged or condemned. So it can't be the God of the Bible. Now, I, I think they missed it as I'm trying to show. But then they, they also say this, the various Vedic loci of an afterlife or Hindu heaven were never mentioned. Nor were reincarnation and dissolution into Brahma, the formless aspect of God, which is the goal of Indian spiritual striving. But the concept of karma, of the accumulation of merits or demerits for our good or bad deeds, may have been vaguely suggested by reports of a, quote, white robed man with a book of accounts. Now they totally miss the, the connection to the Bible, but they report that multiple Indians mentioned this man of brilliant light who they know to be God and they mention books of accounts. And actually these books of accounts are mentioned across the globe. Indie ears are just confirming what the scripture says, that in heaven, for some reason, our deeds are recorded in books and there is a book of life which records the names of those who have given themselves back to God. And the reason for all of this is that God wants to free us you know, the reason he wants us to know our name is in the book of life, he wants to free you from all fear of judgment or condemnation. God doesn't want you to ever worry or wonder whether you will be with him for eternity. And he says, all we have to do for our name to be in the book of life forever is accept his free gift. That's it. Now, the problem is we can know we're safe and secure, but sometimes Christians take this to the wrong end. Sometimes Christians treat that like a fire insurance policy. Well, I'm good, I'm safe, so now I'm gonna live like hell. And that is a total miss of what's, what Jesus teaches because what you do in this life does matter. It does matter. It doesn't matter in terms of your right standing with God and whether you'll be in heaven, but it matters in terms of your experience of heaven. So at some point in Earth's history, when Earth's history is concluded, there'll be a second judgment called the Bema Seat. It's actually a judgment for God's children. This is how it's talked about in 2 Corinthians 5. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Now, that word translated judgment is the Greek word Bema, Bema Seat. It was actually the judges stand at the Greek Olympics. See, this is where the judge gave the rewards or the, the gold or silver or bronze medal for a race well run. In their day, crowns were given. This is a rewards judgment. God wants to reward everybody. He wants to reward you for every faithful act, every faithful deed, even every motive done to please God. Isn't that encouraging? You don't have to earn your way into heaven, but everything you do this side of, of, of heaven, once that's settled, he wants to reward. It matters and it counts. 
Now on that day, some of us are gonna realize that we wasted our lives. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna, yes, we're gonna be secure and safe in heaven, but we're gonna realize we didn't take anything from all our work and labor on this earth because it was all about our, us. None of it was about God. But others of us are gonna realize that all those little acts of kindness no one saw, all those little times when, when we just held on and persevered in order to just be faithful to God, when we resisted temptation, when we cared about others, when we forgave when they wouldn't forgive us, when we loved when it wasn't easy to love, all of it he saw and all of it will be rewarded. The Bema seat, this judgment, is like a huge Oscar celebration where all of God's children across human history will personally be rewarded. That's what God promises. Now, the rewards will be different, but as Jonathan Edwards, famous theologian said, you know, he, he said, all of us will be full to overflowing in heaven, but not all with the same capacity. See, I believe that's true, that the way we live our lives determines whether we're gonna be a little cup of overflowing of God's joy or a big, huge, you know, barrel. Live to be a big, huge barrel because it's gonna be worth it. You know, Isaiah looked forward to that time and said, see your savior come, see his reward is with him. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 27, for the son of man is going to come in his father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. So let's imagine that day. You know, imagine that day when when you stand before the creator of the universe who loves you more than any other, Amen. and he wants to show you the, the sum of your life, and he wants to reward you for, for all those things that nobody else has seen. Imagine that, and live for that. And you know, let me just say a little caveat. If after this series, you get all excited, more excited about studying near-death experiences than you do the words of Jesus, I've failed. i failed. Don't don't live by near-death experiences. Live by the words of God. But these show that the words of God are true. I mean, we already knew that, but it's just confirming it. You know, think about what that's going to be like that day. And imagine it so you'll live for it, work for it, plan for it, sacrifice for it. Because when you can imagine a great next material p purchase or a great vacation, or you can imagine a great uh, retirement, you'll live for it, sacrifice for it, work for it. So imagine heaven. Imagine this beautiful city that God has prepared for those who love him. Imagine the day that you enter in and experience the reward of life. John, Jesus' youngest disciple, was the only disciple not killed for his faith, but he was imprisoned on an island called Patmos. And there he received this revelation from God, where he saw heaven, he saw what was to come. And listen to how he tries to describe it in our words, but it's otherworldly. And then I want you to listen to the testimony of people that we've been interviewing, trying to describe the same place, just as real. Revelation 21.1, John says, he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high. He showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, it shone with the glory of God. Its brilliance was like a very precious jewel, like a jasper, but clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. And on the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. The angel measured the city with a rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia, or about 1,400 miles in length and as wide and as high as it is long. That's huge. It's half the footprint of America and equally as, as high. The angel measured the wall using human measurement. It was 144 cubits or about 216 feet thick. The wall was made of jasper, the city of pure gold as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The 12 gates were 12 pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold as pure as transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, Jesus, are its temple. The city does not need the sun or moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light. 
The kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. The Apostle John is trying to describe something that is otherworldly. You know, he's trying to describe it in our three-dimensional terms, but as we've been seeing, this is beyond our dimensionality. And you know, when I used to read Revelation, and before I studied near-death experiences, uh, particularly of Christians trying to describe the same city, I would read this description in Revelation, and I kind of had this picture of a a gaudy televangelist set. It wasn't very appealing, quite honestly. You know, like wrought iron gates with pearls stuck on it, and you know, this yellow brick road, gaudy kind of street. And I was like, yeah, just, that seems like a human invention. That's what I thought. And then I start reading these near-death experiences, and they're struggling to describe the same place. You know, and I, I want you to hear just the, the mysterious otherworldly descriptions that this TWA airline pilot and this spine surgeon and this pastor, who, by the way, have not heard each other describe this. In fact, Dale, the, the pilot, said he's never read another near-death experience. He felt like God didn't want him to, to keep his kind of pure. And yet, listen to how, kind of like people describing an accident from different corners of the street, they're describing the same place from different perspectives. Listen to this. So in, in your book, you describe flying into, is it the New Jerusalem? What is it? Uh, and, the, and describe the beauty and what you saw. I get this incredible uh, airborne view, a descending, slowing down airborne view of the city of gold. And it's city. It's a city that's walled. O- over the city were majestic mountains that were as gorgeous as any that could be ever seen. However, they did not look that different than earth. I wasn't disappointed by that. I'm not saying that. I noticed snow. So think about that. Snow. What does that mean? Atmosphere? Temperature? Snow? What's that all about? I noticed flying birds later. What does that mean? Uh, These are the kind of questions I ask. Okay, if a bird is to fly, it can't be a vacuum. I'm hearing music. What does that mean? Music can't transfer in a vacuum. It has to be in an atmosphere. There's atmosphere here in heaven. Oh, what does that mean? That and means, you're flying, but you don't have wings. Right. I'm floating is what I would call it. I'm floating and coming in, descending. And finally, I come down and touch ground level for a while. And I'm hovering between 40 feet ish and down. And, uh, but I, I recognize later, oh, there was gravity there. There is gravity. There is atmosphere. There's water. There are animals. Inside the city, I, I could see, uh, we'll start from foreground to back, if you like. Uh, I could see the townships, as I call them, homes that people lived in, homes that were likely to be created for the people of heaven. Interestingly enough, they struck me by not so much the size as the architecture. I know nothing about architecture Hmm. at all. I still don't. But uh, I recognize that there was something divine about the architecture of the buildings. There were small, what we would call like uh, condos here. There were single family residences that we would call here. There were huge palaces. And I could see that, but and this like, is all inside the wall? On the other around. side of the wall. I saw none of this. And how big is this city? I mean, can you tell? I could not tell other than it was beyond the horizon both directions. There's countryside inside. So that it's, a, it's gorgeous, beautiful, all of the adjectives times a thousand. So coming up to this dome structure, maybe was it a city? Could you tell? Was there something inside? Was there an entrance into it? There was an entrance. It was a big arched entrance and a wide threshold. What did that look like, that entrance? Well, similarly, it was almost like the old Roman block arches. But again, these blocks were uh, seemingly solid looking, but not. They were really woven 
together with love, which Hard is describe. nonsensical. Uh, but but you were aware of a structure yes, and art. Yes, it seemed structural to me. And was there, and you know, the gate of heaven or a It gate? wasn't, well, I don't, there wasn't a gate. When it was gate. just an archway. Yeah. And I would say again that if I had any inclination that I was coming back, I would have tried to make more mental notes because many of the questions are the same questions that I ask myself now. And I will say that I was able to see many, again, people, angels, spirits, I'm not sure, very busy. And I don't know what they were doing. Inside the archway. Inside, they were all very busy. <laughs> I don't know what they were doing, but they were doing something and clearly doing God's work. Well, the gate is quite large. Um, uh, the, the, the gate itself, the entrance is small. Um, and the wall is very thick, but you can actually see through it. So I'm looking over these people and I can see through it. And there, there appears to be a, this massive boulevard that really kind of bisects the city and it is made of gold. But gold that is so pure, you can see through it. It's, it's, what do you mean? Well, you can actually see through the gold. It's gold and it's visible and tangible, but it is it is pure. Now, we can't imagine that here because gold on earth is one of the densest metals we have. But in heaven, it's so pure, you can see through it. So you can see under it. You can see even the roots of trees and things like that. There are trees there. In fact, the tree of life is there mm -hmm. uh, that we were not able to eat of here. We can eat of it there. And you can, you're looking through I'm looking at the trees. I'm entrance. looking at the gates. I'm looking through the gates. I'm looking down the street. There is a river that flows from this this throne or this hill that's high and lifted up. And I know that's the river of life because we're told that it flows from the throne of God. So uh, many of the things that we know and enjoy and love here uh, are visible there as well. Um, I would say this, and, and um, heaven's never going to be less than this. It's always going to be more. Yeah. So whatever you imagine here that is is meaningful to you, do, to you, the relationships, the beauty, and let's face it, there's some glorious places yeah. on earth, but there should be because God created it. This is His place. So heaven is not going to be less than that. It's going to be more than that. There are structures on both sides of the, of the city. Uh, they look like uh, mansions to me. I mean, they're glorious places for people to dwell. Um, so it, it's just a it's just an incredibly awesome, overwhelming, bustling place. It's not a boring place. There aren't any cherubs sitting around on clouds playing harps. This is an active, exciting, thrilling place. And at this magnificent gate, a very large uh, uh, wall, a uh, very thick wall, and, uh, but it could, there's a gate and it looks like the inside of an oyster. It's a, it's a gate made of pearl. Uh, really quite dazzling, very br brilliant, very beautiful. It almost looks like it's pulsating with life, except I, I know it's the light reflecting off the gate that make it, makes it look that way. The arch and the tunnel was the same substance. It was not stone, but it was in the stone. But what was the substance? It, the substance was pearl. It, it looked like liquefied pearl, and when the light from the throne room, that's the only light that there is, emanated through, it just bounces off the pearl. There's no shadows and there's no darkness at all. And there's no need for unnatural or artificial light. Mm. And it's, it is a, a sight to behold and welcomed me to go through it, but I, I couldn't go through it at that time. It's so wild, you know, I mean, you, you stop and think, these are, these are credible people. I mean, spine surgeons and, and airline pilots and pastors and uh, college professors, and they are either all crazy, but there are hundreds more like them, even thousands more saying similar things, or they're actually describing a world that John saw and wrote about in Revelation. A world more real than the one we live in now. A place of overwhelming joy and community and love and life. 
A place that Jesus said where we'll have work to do, but without all the laboriousness and the, the time constraints, where we'll have projects, where we'll have houses and property. He said, if you can be trusted with property that is not your own, I'll give you property that will last. He said, some will govern cities, some will govern nations, we'll tend to animals. Yes, there'll be animals there, scripture tells us that. Yes, we'll we'll be with our pets. Why would God give us pets to love and then take them away forever? And there will be nature and wonders to explore. There will be culture and dance and art and music. Music of of another complexity in nature as, as we've been hearing. This is life. Jesus said it's abundant life. It's so much better than anything we get a little taste of on this earth. So why wouldn't you live for it? Why wouldn't you invest your life for it? Why wouldn't you serve and give and love to follow God? Because he promises he wants to reward you forever. And that's what I want. I want all of us to truly be great ones in the only kingdom that will ever last. So as we wrap up this Imagine Heaven series, here's what I would would like to do. Um, we're going we're gonna to take our offering and the band's going to lead us in a song. And it's really a song of dedication, of recommitment. And I want to encourage you that, you know, if during this Imagine Heaven series, you have decided to receive God's free gift of heaven, you know, I, I want to encourage you to let us know, to take that program and on the bottom on that info card, just write, put your name and, and email address and write, I decided. And, and the reason I want to ask you to do that is because first, I want to pray for you personally. And second, I want to send you some, some next steps of how to grow in this relationship because it's a relationship to grow in. So write that down. And, and you know, if you've never been baptized, I want to encourage you this third Wednesday coming up um, at our Wednesday night service, November 18th, we're going to have a baptism. I want to encourage you to be baptized. And if you're interested in finding out about that, just write baptism on that info card and, and drop that in the offering bucket and we'll send you information on that. You know, if, if you've never really gotten connected in, so maybe you, you consider yourself a, a follower of Jesus, but you're still isolated from our community. You know, God doesn't want isolated Christians. He wants people who learn how to express his love and acceptance and encouragement to one another the way he wants to give to us. And so I want to encourage you to get connected around here and just write on the info card, get connected. And, and we'll follow up with you to give you ideas of how you can make some friendships around here, how you could get in a life group, how you can grow together with us. All right? So let me pray. And you know, it, maybe you haven't given your life to God yet and you want to leave here today knowing that you know that you know you're right with him. Just pray with me. He says that's all he needs is a heart turning back to him. And you know, no matter how far you've wandered or strayed, let this be the day that it's not just gonna be another series that comes and goes, another cool message or book that you read, but that today you're gonna say, Lord, I wanna live for you. So let's pray that together. Lord God, how we thank you for your great love that quite honestly, we can't imagine it. And these people who have claimed to be in your presence, they just can't stop talking about it. So I know it's greater than we've ever, ever thought about. I mean, what else could make even mothers of children they love want to stay with you forever? Lord, some of us, we just want to say, I've decided. I've decided to let what Jesus did count for me. I want your forgiveness. I want you to come be God of my life. And if that's what's in your heart, just tell him right now. That's all he needs. For you to know that you are forever his and nothing can ever change that. And God, the rest of us, we want to dedicate ourselves fresh today to live for you, to live for the life that you reward. And thank you that we can, we all can, no matter what we face. We don't have to compare ourselves to one another. You've each given us separate individual lives to live, races to run, but we can be faithful. So help us, God, as we commit to living to please you and you only. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.